And so whenever we were defining the system, hey, welcome. Uh, you know, we, we don't have to have, I guess, a physical barrier for defining the system. So in chemistry, when we have a chemical reaction, that's the system. So even if the system is open to the atmosphere and so on, uh, we sort of define the, the system as that chemical reaction. And if it produces gases, come on, uh, then that, that, those gases expand, they go outside the beaker, and they push back the atmosphere. And so that system is expanding against one atmosphere. Even though there's no piston, even though there's no balloon or anything like that, we can still calculate the work that was done by pushing back the atmosphere. Everybody follow me on that. Well, how would we know that it's work? How do we know it's directional and not just random and then heat? Uh, because this system, our chemical reaction, say in this beaker, uh, is generating gas. And so the atmosphere is being pushed back. Now there's mixing, okay? So this would be the work done if, if there was no mixing. So we do a lot of, I would say, tortured definitions. We're saying we're pushing the atmosphere back, even though there's no barrier. But this would be the maximum amount of work we could get out of the system if there were a barrier. So we can calculate the work. Whether we realize it or, or are able to capture it, you know, that's another thing. But we can certainly calculate the work that would be done if it was to push back the atmosphere. Make sense? Okay, so this is a very simple calculation. Like I said, I've made the numbers work out to where we have one mole of iron and it's producing one mole of gas. And so we really just need to see how, uh, what the volume change is in going from zero moles to, to one mole of hydrogen gas. So we need the, the volume of one mole. So we started this calculation last time at 300 Kelvin and the gas constant, so we'll use um, the 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So that version of the gas constant. And so that way the units all work out. We have atmospheres canceling. We have Kelvin canceling. And the moles, one mole of gas. And so this gives us the, the volume change by generating one mole of gas starting at nothing. Everybody follow that. So it's pretty simple. Ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Rearrange to solve for volume. So, if someone would type that into their calculator for me. Twenty-four. Okay, that's close enough. Twenty-four liters. And so, someone find the equation for work in your notes. It's just a couple of pages back. So this is expansion work against the constant pressure. Yeah, so it was the work is equal to negative. Yeah, negative P external times delta V minus one atmosphere times twenty four liters. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that. So then this is our work, and it is minus 24 liters atmospheres. So that's our work. Anybody have any problems with that? It's a weird unit. It's a very weird unit. I like to have my work in joules. Okay, because it's an energy term, and you're using it's an energy exchange. You've You've, the system has lost energy by doing work on the surroundings, and I've got liter atmospheres, and I don't like that very much at all. Okay. Now, you can use all of these definitions, like Pascal for pressure and liter, and get to meters cubed, and so on. So you can go through this really long and tortured method to get from liters atmospheres into joules. Or you can use two versions of the gas constant that you've memorized. You like that? Okay, you've got the gas constant. We just used one. Do you know this one? Do you know this 0 0.08206 from freshman chemistry and doing all of the PV equals NRT equations? Yeah, so that one should be one of the gas constants that you have memorized. What's the other form of the gas constant, R, that you have memorized? 8.314. Yeah, so we have 
and 0.082. We have both of those memorized. Let's look at the units on those. So let's take our 24. So work is equal to minus 24 liters atmospheres. And I'm going to multiply this by 1. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to multiply by R over R. In the bottom, I'm going to put 0 0.08206. And the units on that are liters, atmospheres, per mole Kelvin. I keep hitting my hand, jumping ahead. Okay, so that's <clears throat> that is my um, my gas constant for the PV equals in RT down below, and then I'm going to put the joules per mole Kelvin on top. So 8.3 joules per mole Kelvin. When I learned this trick, I was so excited. Look at all the units. My per moles are gone, my kelvins are gone, my liters or atmospheres are gone, and I've got joules. <laughs> okay, thanks. So it's pretty easy. Just remember your, your two gas constants and you're ready to go. Now if you were to take 8.314 and divide it by 0 0.082, you'd end up with 101.325 that is um, the definition of one atmosphere in terms of Pascals. And so that number shows up, and it's buried in those two gas constants. So anyway, you basically multiply this by 100, so it's 2,400 joules. <clears throat> and so that's our work that was generated by this reaction. So it pushed back the atmosphere and, and it lost 2,400 joules to the surroundings. Any questions on that? Just, again, an example calculation of, of work done against the constant external pressure. So let's move on and we'll talk about calorimetry, how we measure heats of reaction and so on. <clears throat> this is going to be the lab in about three weeks. So we do a couple of Excel labs, um, and then we get into the lab and we actually start doing uh, some heat measurements. <clears throat> this is a schematic of uh, bomb calorimeter. Now it's a it's a bomb uh, mainly because it's a sealed vessel and you have a combustion reaction inside, and it's a bomb that you don't want to go off. <laughs> okay, so you don't put too much material in there. We put you know, I think 0.2 grams in there and then stuff it with oxygen and light it off. We have a little electrodes that go in there and you ignite the bomb and it burns completely because you have excess oxygen. And so whatever organic material you put in there is going to burn completely and so you get all of the joules of heat out. Uh, you don't have any work because it's a sealed container and there's no expansion or compression. So all of that uh, energy comes out in the form of heat and goes into the water. And we have a thermometer in the water and we measure the heat change in the thermometer. So essentially this is what I just said. Now you can calibrate this whole system using a heater, a resistive heater, and you take the current times the voltage times the time. You could use a stopwatch or you could log the data and you could get the amount of energy that you put in. And we will also do that. So let's look at the data that comes off of these calorimeters. So this is an example of, uh, of a thermogram. So you start out with this initial temperature measurement. See, it's roughly room temperature, a little warm. And you're collecting data for several seconds. And you can see this on the front of the calorimeter. You don't actually see this graph. You, get, you have to go to Excel to plot your data. And then you ignite the bombs. So you punch the ignition, the combustion reaction happens, and then it takes a while for the heat to come out. But it jumps pretty rapidly once it starts coming out of that metal bomb and you see the temperature go up pretty rapidly and then it starts to you know rise at a slower rate and eventually it kind of reaches a constant. Now the question is where do we decide what the delta T is? Because there's a lot of data points on there and a lot of times you really can't see it in this one but 
you can see this this line it a lot of times it's tapering off because if you've got a door full of warm water there's evaporative cooling and so it doesn't stay at a constant temperature and so this top of this curve is actually goes up, reaches the maximum, and starts to taper off. And even at the initial point too, it might be sloped down. And so let's say, what well, would we'll take the maximum area? If we, if we pick this right here and we try to do a delta T, what is the temperature value here? Now it's kind of easy to see because I've drawn this blue line, but what if that blue line wasn't there? How would you decide what the delta T was? Do you see the question? Where are you going to pick on that chart to find delta T? Because once you have delta T, then you convert that to joules. You know that the um, amount of joules it takes to raise water one degree. And so you measure the temperature change and you pull out the joules. Make sense? Okay. And so anytime you have a question like this, where there's a judgment call, it helps to standardize the, the procedure. And that's what the ASTM has done you know, the Association of Standards and Technical Measurements. So they have decided on the method for coming up with the delta T. And so this is the method. You take the initial data and we extrapolate a line. Okay, so you can do this with a ruler. You can draw a line through that data. And then you take the, the final data and you extrapolate a line backwards. So with the ruler or with Excel, you draw those two linear relationships. And then you look to see from here when this temperature mark reaches 63% of the rise. Now, why? I don't know. That's what ASTM says. So this, this dashed line is 63% of the distance between those two marks, 0.63 of this. If this is 1, then that's 0.63 makes sense so if that, that distance between the red and the blue lines is one then that dash line is 0.63 and then where that dash line crosses the data then you draw this vertical mark and that's your delta T so it's unambiguous that's the point we need an operational definition that tells us how to collect that delta T so that it's unambiguous. So that if you analyze the data and you analyze the data, you don't get different answers because you're using different procedures. Okay. And so you'll get more practice with this when you, when you um, go into the lab and you analyze the data in Excel. Now I've made a nice little workbook for you that does these extrapolated lines and gives you the delta T. So you paste in your data and you can look to see why well, I did my formulas and so on, but it'll do this analysis for you. Because it was a pretty ugly thing to try to get a linear relationship and extrapolate that line. I had to find the equation for the data at the beginning, and then I had to run the thing backwards and find an equation for the final data and extrapolate. So you'll, you'll have to answer some questions about that spreadsheet, but this is one time where I made the spreadsheet for you. You don't have to make it yourself. Now, it's, this is a beautiful set of data. This one's a little worse. Notice the extrapolated lines are not flat, but this is typical. And this is data that came from a resistive heater. And so we just talked about the current, the voltage, and time. You know, that, that as you add current over time, you know, at a certain voltage, you're going to be putting in more joules. And it is a linear relationship. So you can see this, that, that slope right there is just pumping joules into the liquid with time at a given voltage and a given current. So it's not an abrupt change. With a resistive heater, you plug it in and you just have a linear relationship. You put the joules in, the temperature rises. And the slope of that line is your heat capacity. Joules in, temperature change, yeah. So the, the slope of energy with respect to temperature is the heat capacity. So we could use this data actually to, to confirm the heat capacity of water. Because we're putting in a certain amount of joules, we know that if we know the voltage and the current and the time and then we know the temperature change as well. So this one is where you really need that spreadsheet or this, you extrapolate this line back, you extrapolate the bottom line forward. When it reaches 0.63, then you take the delta T. So this would be the delta T for this particular experiment. Questions before we move on. Just kind of giving you an idea of what's coming with calorimetry. 
And this is all within the first law. So help me restate the first law. There's several ways we put it. The internal energy of an isolated system is constant. Yes, the internal energy of an isolated system is constant. Okay, that's a very simple way to state the first law. What's another way to state it? Yeah, mass energy is constant, or mass energy is neither created nor destroyed. Energy can be converted into mass, and mass can be converted into energy, but mass energy is neither created nor destroyed. That's another way to say it. Um, here's some just practice problems that you can do on your own related to turning current and voltage and time into joules. So just showing you some of the things that you can do. So, so let's move on to the second law. Oh, well, let's, let's do a bit of heat capacity here. So like I said, the slope of that line, you're putting in amount of energy and you're seeing a temperature change and the slope of that line is the heat capacity. You have two heat capacities. You have the heat capacity at constant volume, which is what you would have inside a sealed container where it couldn't expand. And then in an open top uh, beaker of water, that would be the heat capacity at constant pressure. So that liquid can expand a little bit. Now we have a couple of different terms that people use for the similar values. So heat capacity is typically given for the per mole, for the per mole number. So the heat capacity, like for a polyatomic gases, would be 25 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, for water at room temperature, the experimental value is 72 joules per mole Kelvin. But then you might hear people talk about specific heat. And so whenever you hear specific heat, that's per gram of material. So it would be 4 joules per gram Kelvin. Occasionally you'll hear people say specific heat capacity, which is a real problem because then you don't know if it's per gram or per mole. <laughs> okay. So I try not to say that. I say specific heat or heat capacity, but I don't say specific heat capacity because then you don't know if I'm talking about a molar basis or a per gram basis. And so then, uh, let's just review the equations that we have so far. So we have the irreversible expansion work term. So that would be uh, expansion against the constant pressure. So this is a great sheet to star. This is note card, you know, vill here. You can put all of these things on and know how to use them. You have 101.325 joules per liter atmosphere. So that's that conversion that we used using our two gas constants. And we have the isothermal reversible expansion where it was uh, the integrated integration with respect to volume gave us this natural log term because it was dv over v. And so we have the, the final and initial. We're actually getting a little bit more work out of a reversible process. We have the enthalpy, which is related to the heat capacity at constant volume times the change in temperature and the internal energy. So Look at these two equations here. These are very valuable going forward. We have the internal energy. We're just taking that heat capacity constant volume times the temperature change. And then if we have more than one mole, we take into account the number of moles. And then enthalpy, same equation, but with Cp, the heat capacity constant pressure. So that's the main difference between internal energy and, and enthalpy. And then this is your friend right here. The heat capacity at constant pressure is just the heat capacity at constant volume with one more R, one more unit of R. So you remember all of those exercises we did and then we had on the first exam where what's the heat capacity at constant volume for helium or for water at room temperature. You could calculate all those CVs well, now for CPs, you just add another two halves R. So let's jump over to the entropy notes and cover the other two laws of thermodynamics. So we've done the zeroth law, which is the definition of temperature. We've done the first law, which was conservation of energy. Now we'll do entropy. <coughs> Review. 
Okay, so these, the definitions of the second and third law of thermodynamics have to do with entropy. And so this is a statement of the second law of thermodynamics. No process is possible in which the sole result is the absorption of heat from a reservoir and its complete conversion into work. If this were possible, on, on, a, on a perfect basis, we could make a, a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> but essentially, this, this is saying that that's not possible. It might be ideal. We might be able to write it out that way in mathematical form. But this is those kinds of physics problems where you, you negate friction, you negate all of these things that, uh, that make the, the possible improbable. Okay. And it's saying this is not possible for that sole conversion of heat to work perfectly. Now we did have this, this reversible isothermal expansion work. So let's look at that equation. So this is the work for, for an isothermal uh, and reversible expansion. And then we also have that internal energy equation where we take the heat capacity and the temperature change. And if, if it's isothermal, then delta T is zero. Okay. So the internal energy change is zero. And so in that case, then work is equal to minus heat. And so this, this process, this reversible process, isothermal expansion and isothermal uh, compression, mathematically seems to violate the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> right? Because the heat is turned into work. There's no other little factors in there, and so on. But practically, it's not possible. Okay? And then also to get, a, to get a heat engine, then we have adiabatic expansions and compressions too. And so those that the heat flow is zero. And, and so this, we're not able to build a cycle out of just isothermal expansions and compressions. We have also these adiabatic um, expansions and compressions, and we're going to get to that when we get to the Carnot cycle, so this perfect cycle, and even that perfect cycle has limits to its efficiency. We're not able to get to 100% efficiency. And so part of the reason we can't do that is because this, this term of entropy, you know, order to disorder is spontaneous. You know, we've seen this regularly. You drop a ball, and it bounces, but it doesn't bounce up to where, where you dropped it. Even a golf ball bounces really well, but you drop a golf ball, and it doesn't quite come all the way to the top. Why is that? Because that energy that it deposits into the floor is lost to disorder. If you had a perfectly solid, I mean, like perfectly elastic uh, floor that couldn't absorb any energy at all, then that energy would have to be returned back to the ball. But that's just not the case. You have all of these vibrations. You know about vibrational degrees of freedom. Once you sort of excite those vibrations, you're not going to get that energy back. It's just going to be randomized. You're going to populate those energy levels, and you're not going to be able to get that, that energy back. And so disorder to order is improbable. I mean, I, I, it's hard to say impossible, because mathematically you could calculate the possibility, but it would be something on the order of 10 to the minus 50 or 100. You know, it would be so improbable as to be impossible. What that would look like would be a ball sitting on the tabletop and all those atoms in the tabletop randomly vibrating and then all of a sudden they, they just coincide to hit that ball in a non-random way and the ball hops off the table. Like I said, mathematically, not impossible. You could calculate with all the atoms in the table what the probability of these five atoms having a vertical velocity. <laughs> okay. So you could calculate it, but it would be such a small number that it would essentially be impossible. And so this, this idea of this entropy of an isolated system increases in the course of a spontaneous change. Again, that's an isolated system. Now, if you define your system in a smaller value, you're going to have the entropy outside your system increasing more than the entropy inside. So if we take a refrigerator, we put water in the freezer, and we freeze that water, okay? We're reducing the entropy of that water. Now it's ice. Think about the atoms. They're able to move around. Now they're fixed. 
So even from a particle in a box standpoint, they're now in a smaller box. The energy levels are further apart, the entropy has dropped. But how did we get that to happen? We took the heat out of the water and we put it into the room. And so the gas molecules in the room now have more entropy. So the entropy in the ice decreased this much, but the entropy of the gas molecules in the room increased that much. So we've got to pay our bills. If we can reduce the entropy in a local area, we have to increase it more in, an, in some other place. Now the entropy of the isolated system increased. So the whole house, if you were to calculate the entropy of the kitchen, the whole system's entropy increased, but the local entropy of the ice decreased and the room air, the entropy increased even more. So, so managing entropy is what we do in refrigeration and heating and air conditioning. We try to push the energy in a certain way and part of the reason we can get it to be spontaneous is managing the entropy. And now this is an interesting thing. We talked about the universe being the, the simplest isolated system, simplest meaning simplest to define, the universe, okay? It says that the, the entropy as a whole is moving towards disorder, okay? And even from a particle in a box, if the universe is expanding and all of our measurements say that it is, then the box is getting bigger all of the just the average energy density of the universe the energy levels are getting closer together which means more energy levels are being populated which means that the partition function for the universe is getting bigger which means entropy is getting bigger so it's kind of amazing to think about that the universe as a particle in a box system okay. a lot of particles i think it's like 10 of this 71 or something like that, I don't know. So we have this uh, entropy is increasing for the universe, but it's still very low. We still have condensed phases. Remember, gases would have the highest entropy. And so we still have planets, we still have you know, dense stars, we still have liquids in places and so on. So the universe has still got a fairly low entropy compared to what it could be. It could be all just a, a gas of neutrinos. And so that's actually a huge deal. Uh, from the eight, you know, 1800s and 1900s, they called this the, the entropy problem of the universe. Now, why would it be a problem for these you know, modern scientists? If the entropy is always increasing and it's low, relatively low, that means it had a beginning. If the universe is eternal, the entropy would be huge by now. And so they called that, an, they called that the, the entropy problem of the universe because it implied a beginning. So this is one more sort of evidential piece that the universe had a beginning, the Big Bang Theory. Okay. And so I thought that was interesting that it's tied into entropy. When I found that out, I put it in the notes. So I thought that's pretty cool. Okay. So. so then for, a fa uh, for this reversible process, the heat, we, we scale that by the temperature and that's how we can calculate the entropy. Then we can take that and combine that with the, the heat being minus work uh, in terms of an isothermal process. And so we have that isothermal reversible expansion, which is our work term. We change the sign, divide by temperature, and that's our entropy change. So the entropy change for that reversible isothermal expansion process is given by this equation. Notice temperature is missing because we divide it by temperature. And the negative sign is missing because it's, uh, the heat is negative work. So let's look at the third law of thermodynamics. So at zero Kelvin, all the excited state energy has been sucked out of a substance and the partition function reduces to one. And so if we were to use Boltzmann's equation uh, for entropy, that's the natural log of the partition function and the partition function is one, natural log of one is zero, so entropy goes to zero. We could show that just using that Boltzmann's <coughs> equation for countable energy states. Um, and if S is a measure of disorder, then S goes to zero as temperature goes to zero. And that's the Nernst heat theorem. And so this is uh, the statement of the third law, which you've probably seen, heard. This is what we tell you in the freshman chemistry as well. The entropy of a perfect crystalline substance is zero at T equals zero. <clears throat> and the main point, introducing it that way, especially to the freshman text, is 
that we can now make tables of standard entropies because we have a reference point. So we set zero at zero Kelvin and then all the entropies are positive. Uh, there's a few exceptions to that in terms of aqueous solutions. They have negative entropies, uh, mainly because of the order that they, they, um, they generate in solution. And so we can go and look at thermodynamic tables and do delta S of reactions and calculate those. But before that, let's uh, get into a Kahoot to review all of the thermodynamic laws. Let us, this will get our brain cells firing. Need to borrow a device? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let me see what I've got. You got it? Okay, good. Thank you. Turn the sound down for you, since you get so stressed out. <laughs> All right, we're ready to go. Did you get in? No, I didn't. Did I miscount? I miscounted. Oh, boy. I'm sorry. So no process is possible, which W equals minus Q perfectly. What law is this? Yeah. All right, very good. We've got a good majority there. Let's see if we can get some perfect ones. All right, energy is neither created nor destroyed. Which law is this? Dun, dun, dun. Let's see those answers come up quickly. Very good. I'm going to take a photo. That's great. All right, another quick one. <clears throat> we just talked about this. As T goes to zero, S goes to zero. Which law is this one? I should move the numbers around so that you guys have to. No. No. <laughs> oh, we got one swing and a miss. Okay. Four laws, four questions. Which two objects are in thermal equilibrium? They share a property. I should ask what the property is. Very good. Somebody's waiting for us. Oh, no. You're breaking my heart, people. The zeroth law of thermodynamics. The two objects are in thermal equilibrium. The reason they're in thermal equilibrium is that they share that property, and that property is temperature. So that's why I picked this clever little photo of people putting their toes on a radiator, because again, they want their toes. They probably don't want them to share the full temperature of that radiator, but they're on the path to getting some toasty toes. All right, how do we do? Very good. Yay. All right, very nice. So let's look at some of the standard entropy values. We can t calculate the entropy of phase transitions. So if we have a system and its surroundings, uh, one atmosphere, uh, we can look at evaporation and condensation. You know, that's, that's uh, evaporation and condensation would be the two processes, the two arrows in, in water becoming steam and steam becoming water. Uh, it's happening in one atmosphere, 373 Kelvin. We can look at melting and freezing of water in equilibrium with ice at one atmosphere and 273 Kelvin. And so, this uh, heat is that delta H of transition, or delta H of freezing, or delta H of, of vaporization. And so we take that transition enthalpy, which we can look up in tables, and divide it by that temperature, and you get the entropy change. So that's pretty simple. You've got delta H of vaporization for water. You just divide it by the 
temperature, the boiling temperature of water, and now you know the entropy change. So that's pretty simple. Okay. Um, and so freezing and condensation are exothermic, so delta H is negative, so freezing and condensation, so water freezing and, and steam becoming water, those are exothermic. Right? So that means delta H is delta H is negative. negative, yes, so it's less than zero, it's negative. And so that means that the entropy change is negative. So water or steam is, you know, a lot of entropy and it's now becoming water. So the entropy has gone down, negative change in entropy. And water is able to move past other water molecules in the liquid state. When it freezes, it's locked into a small space, very ordered arrangement and so the entropy dropped as well. So exothermic pro uh, processes have negative entropy changes in some cases. And then melting and freezing is endothermic, and so you have a positive entropy. You're putting heat in the system to make it happen, and so then that's uh, an increase in entropy. Now we can calculate, so these are the entropy changes shown at those phase transitions, these abrupt jumps. In energy. So if you have, you have temperature along the x-axis, when you get to that phase transition temperature, like freezing or melting, so you're coming along, you're heating it up, it starts to melt, this is the entropy change going from solid to liquid. Then you warm up the liquid, and then this is the entropy change happening when you boil the liquid. And so at the boiling point, you've boiled all the liquid, you've had this huge entropy change, and now you're just heating the gas. And you can integrate this if you know the heat capacities here, here, and here for the liquid and solid and gas. You can add up the entropies all the way from entropy of zero all the way to whatever temperature that you're working at. And so it's just accounting. You just add all of that up. Okay. Now the nice thing is that they've done this for us in terms of these tables. So they've taken, say, room temperature, you know, way up here, I guess, um, for this particular case for oxygen, and they've taken room temperature, oxygen is a gas at room temperature, and it's probably a little past this chart, and they've taken that number, and they said, all right, that's gonna be our standard entropy for oxygen at room temperature, 298 Kelvin. And they put it in a table. So you're really not gonna to have to calculate these things and add them up, you can go to the tables and look up the numbers for the standard values. Uh, this also shows all the heat capacities. And I put this chart in here just to show you for gaseous oxygen. You know, if it was just monatomic gas, you would have this value for heat capacity. If you just had, um, if you were, if for CV, you had five halves R for rotation. And then this is CP, so you add another two halves R, so it's up here at seven halves. So that's the theoretical value for gaseous oxygen without the vibration being active, and this is the experimental value. So it's pretty good, very good estimate for the gas. See that? So the seven halves R is right there, and right there is the experimental value for oxygen. So we understand the heat capacity constant volume for our gases really well, but look at the liquid. It's so much higher because, again, you've got more vibration-like motions that are active so these would be called acoustic waves in the fluid. So large groups of oxygen atoms vibrating against other groups of oxygen atoms. And so that adds much more heat capacity. And so that's why the heat capacity of the liquid is so high. And that's the case you see for almost every substance. And so then we have these standard reaction entropies, which we can look up in tables. So here's an example of hydrogen and oxygen making water. And so we would look up that standard entropy for each reactant and product. And you may remember this from your freshman year, the enthalpy of uh, standard enthalpies and standard Gibbs energies. They, um, you didn't include pure elements, but for the entropy you do. So that's the big difference. I want to make sure you understand that the pure elements are included. And so you need to look up the pure element entropy for oxygen and hydrogen at room temperature in those tables. And so here's an example of the table. And if you notice, here's oxygen. This is, I've grayed out the delta H and delta G uh, columns. But yeah, see it's zero by definition for delta H and delta G formation. 
but the standard entropy is not zero. So that's the oxygen value. We're looking at liquid water from the reaction, and then up here we have the hydrogen value. So you need to include those, those pure element values because the definition isn't a pure element in its standard state. The definition for entropy zero is zero Kelvin. So we put these numbers in and we have products minus reactants. And so we have the, the entropy, standard entropy for water from the table, from hydrogen from the table, and one half the oxygen value. That's another place where people mess up. And so this is the one half. And so we end up with an entropy change of negative 163 joules per Kelvin per mole of hydrogen and per mole of water. Okay, but this is per half mole of oxygen. So if we wanted this value per mole of oxygen for whatever reaction that we're doing, we'd have to double it because that's the number you get. Great. That's the number you get from uh, that reaction, but that reaction is written as a half mole of oxygen. And so you would just double that number to get to the value for one mole of oxygen. Okay. So today we've covered, kind of finished up the first law set of notes, talked about calorimetry, okay, which we're going to do in two weeks or three weeks in the lab. Then we went through the uh, second law of thermodynamics and the third law of thermodynamics, both dealing with entropy. And then we reviewed all four laws. So we now know what temperature is. We know the energy is neither created nor destroyed. We know that there's, uh, even though mathematically we can show systems where uh, you have the pure conversion of heat into work, that, that's not realistic. We're not able to do that okay, because of entropy. Okay. And then we've got a standard value of entropy at zero Kelvin for a perfect pure atomic substance in, in its crystalline form. And so that's our definition that allows us to tabulate these entropy values and calculate standard entropies at room temperature uh, for pretty much any reaction where we have data. If we didn't have data, then we would have to estimate from first principles, but it's much easier to go and collect the data. And so now we have whole organizations that make thermodynamic data banks, and they're quite expensive. I, on a recent grant, I was using one to calculate azeotropic behavior, and the database alone, access to that database was $13,000. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's a lot of data out there and you have to actually pay to get access to it. There's a, you, you don't realize how wonderful the CRC is. You don't have to pay for the money you have to buy the CRC, but for our university, we have access to the electronic version of the CRC. That's a huge resource for you because you didn't have to make those measurements. All right, so we'll talk about it more next time.